got a career development award to study fish oil and R01 grants and uh, multiple other awards. Uh, his uh, own research is on omega-3 fatty acids, but he's becoming a nationally and internationally known speaker and specialist in supplements. And uh, I'm sure you would like to know how to use and what to use. Um, uh, and also your clients might want to know. Uh, so uh, please welcome Dr. Michelle. everybody. Um, Helen, thank you so much for inviting me to this inaugural conference. I'll, uh, I'll try to go at a good clip so that uh, we don't lose too much of our lunch hour. <laughs> so my talk is going to focus on use of natural herbs and, and supplements. Now I just want to caution everyone. Now the emphasis so far has been largely on prevention of illness. In, in my job, I mean, I'm a, I'm a psychiatrist and I work in the um, program at Mass General Hospital that specializes in treating depression. And our primary focus has been on acute treatment of depression. Um, and certainly, a lot of the work that I'm gonna talk about here focuses on that particular use of natural treatments, but I'm also gonna talk about what impact some of these may have in, in prevention of, uh, of illness where, where it's known. Uh, here I'm listing some disclosures. A number of different companies have supported uh, my research on natural remedies. Um, as Helen mentioned, I've also received funding from the government, the NCCIH, uh, the NIH, So what I want to do here is review basically what we know about complementary and alternative uh, medicine therapies, particularly herbal supplements in, uh, in psychiatry. I'll go through the risks and benefits uh, of these, and hopefully um, by the end of this, you'll all be comfortable with regard to informing patients that you work with regarding um, how to use these, um, these medications and remedies safely and um, Uh, as was mentioned earlier um, in, in David Eisenberg's uh, landmark paper, more than 70% of the world uses what we call complementary therapies. And it's not surprising. These treatments are easily accessible. Uh, they're often better tolerated than, than standard medications. And certainly many people who have tried uh, many different uh, FDA-approved therapies and didn't get benefit from them or got a lot of side effects eventually end up turning to, to complementary therapies. Unfortunately, um, relatively speaking, there's still less systematic research on a lot of natural and alternative products. So it's a lot harder as a, as a clinician to make confident recommendations uh, about their effectiveness and safety. Certainly one problem that we deal with is that a lot of people in the general public assume that because medication is available over the counter and natural, that it's automatically safe. That's not necessarily the case. In fact, with increasing use of natural products, we've been seeing more cases of toxic reactions occurring um, and drug-herb interactions, uh, which I'll talk about uh, later on. Another uh, issue has to do with um, the, the marketplace. Obviously, different preparations of herbal remedies um, may be uh, different from each other, even if even if uh, they claim to, to make the same to have the same product. Uh, degree of purity may vary. Active so brand A of a particular herbal drug may not be as effective as a brand B of the same drug. Then there's the issue of cost. Uh, most uh, medical insurance carriers do not cover the cost of these treatments because they're not approved by the FDA. And so people have to pay out of pocket for them. And then um, the issue of buyer beware becomes uh, important. And finally, uh, clinicians in general have not been well educated. Um, I remember when I was in, in medical school, I think we got about three days uh, of nutrition uh, education. Uh, and that was mostly about very rare <laughs> diseases, like very, very, uh, that you know you might see if you, if you practice in the third world, but you're probably not gonna see them uh, here. So I, I think that's been improving, um, but I think we have a ways to go as far as education. Now let me start first by talking about some uh, natural products that are used for the treatment of mood disorders. Uh, St. John's wort, uh, also known as Hypericum perforatum, is a pretty yellow flower that blooms every spring around the day of St. John. That's one theory as to how it got its name. And it, it is 
one of the most widely used herbal remedies for um, psychiatric conditions. It's also one of the better studied ones. There's been somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 published clinical trials, including um, 26 placebo-controlled uh, trials, 14 comparisons with standard antidepressants, um, and various uh, systematic reviews and meta-analyses have emerged to give us a, an overall sense of, uh, of what the body of evidence tells us. By and large, most of these uh, studies are limited by short duration. Um, studies for treating depression typically run in the neighborhood of eight to 12 weeks, and some of these studies run for a month or, or less, so they may not be giving the herbal uh, remedy a chance to, to work. Some of these studies didn't use standardized diagnostic instruments that we use in psychiatry, like the Hamilton depression uh, scale. And also they selected uh, people of, with different degrees of severity of depression, which can be a factor in, in treatment response. That said, by and large, the, the studies as a whole suggest that St. John's wort is more effective than placebo, and approximately as effective as low-dose tricyclic um, antidepressants, particularly for mild to moderate depression. Other uh, studies have examined um, its efficacy in atypical depression, which is a subject of depression, uh, premenstrual syndrome, uh, now known as PMDD, and also a, a study that we did in collaboration with uh, Mark Rappaport's group uh, in minor depression, and these, uh, that, that study didn't show a particularly strong uh, effect. More recently, St. John's Ward has been compared against the newer antidepressants, particularly the, the serotonin reuptake inhibitors like fluoxetine. And there's about 13 trials uh, comparing St. John's work to SSRIs, and uh, two to three Cochrane reviews uh, have emerged. Again, by and large, St. John's work appears to be as effective as the SSRIs and better than, uh, than placebo. Other investigators have tried St. John's work in populations with attention deficit disorder, anxiety, and uh, obsessive compulsive disorder without uh, very much uh, benefit. How does St. John's work work? Um, like a lot of herbal remedies, it has many chemicals in it that may be potentially uh, active, uh, psychiatrically speaking. Hypericin, hyperferrin, and ad adhyperferrin are considered the key uh, psychotropic reagents, and these are thought to interact with the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis um, via cytokine production. So they may result in less uh, inflammatory activity, uh, which uh, is probably one of the key there's some evidence that hyperferrin may have benefits in Alzheimer's dementia as well. That's, uh, that requires further study. St. John's wort is generally considered a safe uh, herbal remedy. Um, the side effects tend to be mild. Dry mouth, dizziness, and constipation are, are common, uh, as are uh, with uh, standard antidepressants. There's some side effects that are more unique to St. John's wort, including um, phototoxicity or sensitivity to sunlight. We uh, ask people who use St. John's wort to be careful if they're going to the beach or on a day-long hike. They should wear sunscreen and a hat to protect themselves. Um, individuals with bipolar disorder um, or manic depression, as it's also called, these individuals who may use St. John's wort to treat the depressive phase of their illness, they can sometimes cycle into mania, as is often the case with antidepressants. So these individuals need to be careful. And finally, interactions, which I'm going to list in a, in a later slide, is have to be one particular concern in psychiatry is that um, St. John's wort has a mild monoamine oxidase inhibitor activity, and th those are antidepressants uh, that, although very effective, can uh, cause serious uh, complications if they're taken in, in combination with certain drugs. And one of them is called serotonin syndrome, which uh, can be fatal if, uh, if untreated. And when, when St. John's wort is combined with SSRIs, this can happen, so we don't advise that people who are taking SSRIs should combine them with uh, St. John's Ward. There's been some potential association with cataracts, but uh, not very clear. Um, what about in, uh, in pregnant women or breastfeeding women? Well, there has been some evidence that uh, St. John's Ward can cause some unpleasant effects in breastfed infants. Um, animal studies suggested low birth weight uh, from uh, in utero exposure. However, one human study didn't uh, show any increased evidence of uh, fetal malformation. this slide I'm listing the major interactions that you should be aware of in people who are using uh, St. John's Ward. 
St. John's wort reduces the activity of an enzyme cytochrome P3A4, which is found in the liver and is one of the key metabolizers of various um, psychotropic neurotrans drugs. By inducing its uh, activity, it reduces the therapeutic activity of the drugs listed on the, on the column on the left side of the slide. Um, so, for example, people um, could, uh, who are taking, for example, Imhinavir and HIV patients, they could develop um, resistant strains of the, of the virus. People who have received transplants and are taking immunosuppressant drugs like cyclosporin, uh, there's been cases of, uh, of rejection of, of transplants as a, as a result. So I think this illustrates that um, these herbal remedies have to be treated with the same caution with which we treat um, standard drugs. To conclude, um, overall the, the results for St. John's Wort are encouraging but somewhat inconsistent. Uh, I think we do need better uh, and more rigorous studies. By and large, people with mild to moderate depression as opposed to more severe depression are, are likely the best candidates for it. Um, we don't recommend, again, combining it with SSRIs. Recommended doses fall anywhere from as little as 300 milligrams a day to as high as 1,800 milligrams a day, um, usually dosed two to three times a day. Um, most uh, people seem to respond well at about 900 milligrams a day. But do remember that different preparations of St. John's wort may vary in, in potency and active ingredients, so be prepared to, to adjust doses as, uh, as needed. Next I'll talk about S-adenosylmethionine, or, or SAMP. SAMP is a compound that all uh, living beings manufacture. Um, the compound is shown on the top left of the, of the screen. And this is a, um, a compound that functions as a methyl donor. You see the, the CH3 group with the arrow pointing to it. That's the group that SAMP donates in a variety of chemical reactions. And um, these are particularly important in the synthesis of neurotransmitters, such as dopamine, serotonin, acetylcholine, and norepinephrine. In the, uh, the lower diagram, you can see the, the chemical uh, pathway. Um, also worth noting, the, the synthesis of SAMI depends on the level of uh, folic acid and B12. Those are two B vitamins that are known to be important as far as immune regulation. And finally, uh, the enzyme MTHFR, methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase, this is an enzyme important um, in the synthetic pathways of folate metabolism, and there are certain polymorphisms or genetic anomalies in this enzyme that can make it less active, and this can uh, also result in, uh, in, in folate uh, uh, inactivity. So all these factors are important, and, and a possible uh, common pathway could be uh, the synthesis of, of SAMI, which, as you see, plays a very important role in neurotransmitter synthesis. Like St. John's Ward, SAMI is very well studied. There's more than 45 published randomized trials, including um, um, studies that use different uh, methods of delivery for the SAMI, oral, intramuscular, and intravenous. Uh, and doses range from 200 to 1,600 milligrams a day in most of the studies. In some of the, the more rigorous studies, uh, SAMI generally outperformed the placebo in um, six out of eight uh, rigorous studies. In comparison with tricyclic antidepressants, SAMI also performed comparably, and in one study, it even outperformed uh, imipramil. Um, our group uh, recently published uh, the first comparison uh, between SAMI and an SSRI. Uh, we recruited 189 patients and treated them for 12 weeks with either uh, SAMI, escitalopram, also known as Lexapro, or placebo. Interestingly, all patients um, in the three groups, on the average, improved about five to six points on the Hamilton B scale, which is uh, quite a, a robust uh, improvement. Um, but there were no significant differences uh, between the treatment groups. So essentially, we were not able to show that any treatment was necessarily better than, uh, than another one. Um, the study was conducted in two sites. We actually have done some sub-analyses. We found, for example, in the, in the MGH site, there seems to be an advantage for SAMI compared to uh, the other site, which was Brown University. Sometimes in clinical trials, particularly those that involve many different sites, there can be factors depending on, on how this a particular site conducts the, the trial and uh, the, the personalities of the doctors there and, and all sorts of potential variables. So um, sometimes uh, we need to do some analysis to understand the, the results of the whole better. Uh, one uh, important niche for SAMI in uh, treatment of depression is as an augmenting agent. As, as we know, um, psychiatry, it's rather unusual for patients to get well with just one antidepressant. Oftentimes they need a combination of treatments. And 
And he has the advantage that it, it doesn't seem to have significant interactions with other antidepressants or other drugs in general, so it can be combined safely with drugs like this. And in some cases, it may even accelerate their action. Uh, in, in a couple of studies, uh, people who received the combination started to feel better in about two weeks as opposed to the usual four to six weeks that uh, people with depression require to respond to antidepressants. Um, our group has done a lot of research on, on Sammy combinations and um, first study was by uh, my colleague Jonathan Alpert, who looked at 30 individuals who had um, either responded partially or not at all to SSRIs. And um, in these patients, uh, they were all given uh, SAMe between 800 and 1600 milligrams a day. And their response rate overall, which means to a greater than 50% improvement on the Hamilton scale, was about 50%. The remission rate meaning um, a final Hamilton scale score of seven or less, which suggests uh, no, no depression. That rate was about 43%, which was quite uh, encouraging for a treatment-resistant population. Uh, George Papacostas, our colleague in the DCFD, followed up on this work uh, and in 2010 published uh, the first controlled uh, study of SAMI augmentation in um, depression. And in the study, it was 73 people taking SSRIs or uh, SNRIs, serotonin, norepinephrine, and epileptic inhibitors. Um, these individuals uh, received augmentation with um, 800 milligrams twice a day of SAMI or placebo, and response rates um, were significantly better for SAMI, 36.1% versus 7.16%. Remission rates were also much stronger for SAMI, 25.8% versus 11.7%. So this was a very encouraging finding. Um, a sub-analysis of the sample also suggested that in, in males with sexual dysfunction, SAMI may have beneficial effects uh, as well. So that's a, another potential niche for, for SAMI. Um, by and large, the results for SAMI are encouraging. Um, typically, again, at doses between 400 and 1600 milligrams a day, uh, those are the ones reported in the literature. However, um, we sometimes go to higher doses, even as high as 3,000 to 4,000 milligrams a day. If the patient is tolerating the SAMI well, um, there's always a good chance that, that you might get a response if you keep uh, increasing the dose. As far as side effects, SAMI tends to be pretty modest. Uh, I've listed some of the more common ones here. In our studies, uh, the most common complaint was usually uh, gastrointestinal nausea or upset stomach, uh, but those, uh, those typically pass after a few days. Um, as with uh, St. John's Ward, do be careful in people with bipolar illness because they can cycle to mania if they take uh, SAMI or other antidepressants. What about in, in pregnant women? Um, well, we know that um, pregnancy generally tends to decrease methylation activity in SAMe levels. Um, there have been some studies in women uh, who were pregnant and had intrahepatic cholestasis who did well with, uh, with SAMe. So in theory, um, pregnant women may benefit from it, but we don't have uh, a lot of safety data, so we still uh, advise caution uh, with pregnant women. Finally, SAMe is one of the more expensive of these uh, natural remedies. It, uh, it only really came to the US in the late 1990s, uh, so there's less uh, competition between manufacturers for it. That will probably change uh, with time, but as you see, uh, a 400 milligram tablet can cost up to $1.25 depending on uh, where you buy it. Um, so, uh, so again, uh, I, I encourage people to, to shop around a little bit um, before they, uh, they take the plunge. Um, a related treatment to Sammy is L-methylfolate, which is uh, commercially available as the prescription form of Deplin. Uh, Deplin is a form of folic acid um, that does not require the extensive conversion that regular folic acid does. As you can see on the right of the, of the slide, um, folic acid uh, usually has to be converted into different forms before it becomes L-methylfolate, which is the most active form. And this also, this process uh, depends on the enzyme MTHFR, which I mentioned uh, earlier. Um, in people with uh, the polymorphism, uh, the abnormality of MTHFR, these individuals do not convert uh, folic acid all the way to L-methylfolate in, in an effective manner, and so uh, they may not be getting enough folic acid, especially when they're pregnant. L-methylfolate um, essentially bypasses all, all that and crosses the blood-brain barrier directly, so it can give uh, the brain you know, a, a, good, uh, a good dose of, uh, of the necessary folic acid that it uh, needs. So we, we, we have um, studied it in, uh, in depression. Uh, in this study, um, 
we looked at the adults with a major depressive disorder and uh, these individuals again had been taking SSRIs and not responding after eight weeks and they were randomized to either 15 milligrams a day of L-methylfolate or, um, or placebo. This study used a two 30 day uh, treatment phase and using uh, a design called the sequential parallel comparison design which uh, basically to, to uh, explain in, in simple terms, this design allows uh, you to re-randomize certain patients in order to be able to obtain statistical power with a smaller sample. And uh, you know, from a feasibility uh, standpoint, this is very important. In this slide, you see the changes from baseline. So in different uh, depression scales, the Hamilton mean 17 item scale, the M Hamilton 28 item scale, the, the quiz SR, we see there was um, significant improvement with L-methylfolate uh, compared to, uh, to placebo. So this was a very encouraging finding. Another commercially available form of folate is serifolin, um, which uh, contains not only the uh, methylfolate, but also um, vitamin B12, B2, and B6. And there's also another preparation that contains N-acetylcysteine as well, which um, reduces oxidative damages. Um, as it stands, the FDA has approved it for treatment or prevention of vitamin D deficiencies, and it, it actually requires a prescription from a physician. Um, it has been used um, for off-label uh, off, off psychiatric indications, including depression and dementia. Uh, so there's, um, there's probably eventually going to be a niche for, for this product in, in treatment of depression and dementia, but uh, we, need, uh, we need studies to, to demonstrate that. Next, I'll talk about the omega-3 fatty acids, which has been one of my primary areas of interest. The omega-3s are long-chain polyunsaturated fatty acids that are primarily found in fish oil, and the fish in turn obtain them from algae and other marine sources. Um, in particular, we're interested in psychiatry in docosahexanoic acid, DHA, or icosahexanoic acid, EPA, and I've uh, shown diagrams of um, these are thought to be the most cyclotropically active of the, uh, of the omega-3s. Um, the omega-3s are very flexible molecules, and they can intercalate their way into the neuronal cell membrane, and they can stabilize the membrane, and also, uh, through other mechanisms, carry out anti-inflammatory effects. Um, and I mentioned, um, you know, the, this may be one of the, the, the mechanisms by which depression develops through uh, increased inflammation. Uh, omega are pretty well studied by now. Um, there's more than 30 uh, randomized trials published in depression, mostly using adjunctive omega-3, in other words, omega-3 added to, uh, to standard antidepressants. Most of the studies either used EPA or a combination of EPA plus DHA, and typically in doses between one to two grams per day. Um, there's a study by uh, Quantin Su in Taiwan in which they gave uh, EPA as a prophylactic treatment for people who were going to receive uh, interferon therapy for hepatitis C. Um, interferon therapy can often precipitate depression, and his uh, study suggested that uh, taking uh, EPA uh, prior to receiving treatment could prevent uh, depression. As far as uh, DHA alone, there's less uh, evidence uh, for it. Uh, there's basically two studies, one by Marin Delegal and one from Amar Group, um, in which um, Basically, our group found that uh, one gram a day of DHA was effective, but higher doses of two and four grams were not. Marangel's study only used two grams a day, and they didn't find a benefit. So in, in that sense, I've always emphasized that the two studies are actually pretty consistent. Um, it's possible that in the Marangel study, they gave uh, a dose too high. The omega-3s seem to have a, what we call a therapeutic window uh, of efficacy. You know, you eat too little and it doesn't work too much, and it doesn't work either. Um, a study in a military sample by uh, Lewis and colleagues suggested that the DHA in particular may have a protective effect against suicide. Soldiers who had higher levels of DHA in their blood uh, were less likely to commit suicide than those who, who had lower levels. So um, that might be one of the uh, potential uh, roles of DHA, uh, not only as far as depression, but also as far as uh, preventing suicide. Um, one of the things that's known about pregnancy is that it depletes the omega-3 that the mother has because all of it goes to the baby's developing brain. Um, and it's been suggested that postpartum depression may be, at least in part, due to, uh, to the loss of omega-3 that the mother experiences. Our colleague
colleague, uh, Marlene Kuhn, and Ms. Denro, and also uh, Dr. Manningville, who I mentioned earlier, both have done some research in postpartum depression. Um, <laughs> their results have been pretty mixed. Uh, I think these studies uh, were limited by small samples. Um, so I think we need to do larger studies to get a better sense of benefits <coughs> in, in terms of uh, postpartum. As far as bipolar disorder, there have been a number of studies Most of the evidence suggests that um, the benefits of omega-3 and bipolar disorder are primarily uh, for treating or preventing the depressive phase of the illness rather than the, the manic phase. So we usually recommend that people with bipolar illness should also take mood stabilizers if they should be taking omega-3s, at least uh, to prevent the <coughs> manic phase. Um, flaxseed oil is another type of omega-3, uh, alpha-linolenic acid which uh, traditionally has not been thought to be psychotropically effective, but there is one study in pediatric um, bipolar uh, disorder patients uh, where they found benefits. So there may be a role for um, ALA as well. Finally, the omega-3s have been studied in uh, borderline personality disorder and schizophrenia with less, um, less encouraging results, but you know, these are very few studies. Um, we recently carried out a um, monotherapy of EPA, DHA, and placebo. Uh, in, in our study, uh, patients only uh, were taking the omega-3, no, no other uh, concurrent antidepressants. This was done in collaboration with Emory University, and um, patients were dosed at 1,000 milligrams a day of EPA or DHA, or, or placebo for eight weeks. And as with the, um, with the SAMe study I mentioned earlier, uh, essentially, on the average, all treatment arms had improvement. Um, but neither, neither EPA nor DHA showed a, a significant advantage over placebo. However, the response rates were quite good overall, 40, 50%, and 30% uh, remission. But again, there were no significant differences between groups. Initially, these, res uh, these results were discouraging, but one of the goals of this study had been to characterize uh, whether certain factors may affect response to, uh, to the omega-3s. In particular, we were interested in inflammatory biomarkers. So we looked at uh, a number of inflammatory and anti-inflammatory biomarkers at baseline to see whether uh, any abnormal levels or elevated levels uh, would uh, necessarily impact on response. Um, in fact, what we found was striking. Um, subjects who had no elevated uh, inflammatory markers tended to not respond that well to EPA relative to placebo. When we looked at subjects who had at least four or five elevated biomarkers at baseline, we, we got a very robust effect size of uh, 1.11 uh, for EPA uh, over placebo. 1.11 is a very strong effect size. Normally, um, with the, uh, the D, the Cohen's D effect size, 0.3 would be small, 0.5 medium, 0.6 or higher large. So 1.11 is a very large um, effect size. We also found that individuals with at least one elevated marker tended to be overweight, um, which uh, is understandable because people who are overweight tend to have more inflammatory activity. As a result of this, we um, were very fortunate. We got a new uh, grant from the uh, NCCIH uh, to study EPA in people who had depression, obesity, and elevated uh, inflammatory markers at baseline. Our thesis is that um, these individuals are particularly well suited to EPA, and we expect we're going to see a, a good, uh, a good response uh, in this uh, in this population. So to to conclude, um, a few recommendations for people with depression: probably a combination of one or one to two grams a day of an EPA DHA combination is best, preferably with at least sixty percent EPA, which was what a meta-analysis by Sublet and colleagues suggested. Um, you know, we, we talked about a potential advantage for EPA, but that still needs uh, to be further worked out. Bipolar studies tended to use higher doses, in some cases as high as 6 to 10 grams per day, which is a, a quite, a, quite a high dose. But I always emphasize, be careful with the risk of cycling to, to mania. As far as side effects, stomach upset, fishy taste uh, are the most common ones, although with most of today's preparations that are much more purified, we don't get too many complaints about that. Historically, there have been concerns about omega-3s potentially increasing the risk of bleeding, but more recent uh, data suggests that those concerns may have been exaggerated. Nonetheless, uh, the conventional wisdom is still to avoid them, say, if you're having surgery or if you're being uh, prescribed anticoagulants for, for hemophilia. 
As far as um, expected mothers um, breastfeeding children and so forth, well, we know that the omega-3s are important for, uh, for the development of the brain, also for allergy prevention. Um, I think in the long run, they will be found to be safe in pregnant women, but we still don't know what particular safe upper limit uh, we would have. So again, we do, um, we do recommend caution. Um, it's been suggested that pregnant women can eat fish safely. Um, so I suspect that probably uh, omega-3 supplements were, will also be deemed safe uh, eventually. And now I'm going to go to um, herbal remedies that are used to treat anxiety uh, conditions. Um, kava, for example, uh, or fibromatisticum, which um, originated in the Polynesian Islands, has um, anxiolytic effects, anti seizure effects, and muscle relaxant effects, thanks to compounds called kava pyrones. Uh, kava is not as well studied as some of the uh, other agents that I talked about earlier. Um, there's about a dozen studies or so. And it's been compared to um, antidepressants and like manufacturing anxiolytics like Dispirum and, and other agents. Um, by and large, um, kava seems to be effective for mild anxiety, but less so for, for panic attacks or panic disorder. Um, other investigations suggest that there may be even some antidepressant effects for, for kava. Kava is generally well tolerated. There are a few uh, mild side effects, but there have been some toxic reactions that have occurred with higher doses or prolonged use. For example, unsteadiness, hair loss, problems with sight or respiration, and kava dermopathy, which is a temporary yellowing by the skin. All of these are fairly benign and will reverse themselves if you just stop taking the, the kava. Um, in recent years, there were uh, a number of cases of severe liver toxicity, including a few uh, that required transplants of livers and, and deaths. And as a result, um, kava was banned in certain parts of Europe. When, uh, when they examined these cases more closely, it was shown that many of these individuals had been taking very high doses, higher than those recommended for long periods, or were taking them concurrently with other potentially uh, liver toxic medications. Also, uh, more recent uh, investigations suggested that if, um, if there's a long period between harvest of the kava and its preparation, um, that may have resulted in the development of hepatotoxic mold, and that may have been a contributor to these uh, effects. As it is, kava is still available in the US, and um, the FDA has been systematically keeping a close eye on its safety, but, uh, but so far it seems to, uh, to be okay. That said, um, I do have certain precautions that I'll talk about. Um, the suggested doses based on the various studies are between 60 and 200 milligrams a day, but again, as with all these herbal drugs, remember potency and efficacy can vary with different preparations. I don't recommend kava for people who have any liver disease or any recent alcohol use or who are taking other medications that may be uh, toxic to the liver. Uh, likewise, um, we need to be cautious in women who are pregnant or breastfeeding, so we don't really know I generally recommend using it under physician supervision and with regular monitoring of liver enzymes, and preferably um, for no more than three months, if uh, that's at all possible. Next, I'll talk about valerian or valeriano officinalis. This is a drug um, based on a, on, a, on a plant that uh, has a very long history. It's been documented in use for at least a thousand years. Gets its name from the Latin word valere, which means It's very popular um, as a sedative and hypnotic worldwide. It's especially popular among uh, the Hispanic population. In, uh, in Boston, I, I treat a lot of um, Hispanic patients who live in, in Chelsea, which is north of, uh, of, of Boston. And many of them uh, find that uh, valerian is quite, uh, quite helpful. In fact, a lot of the research on valerian has come out of the University of uh, Miami, where they, where they treat many of the female patients. Um, there's been about 37 subjects who are not sleeping well or with more asymptomatic individuals. In seven comparisons against benzodiazepines like uh, Valium, Abitin, and so forth, there, there seemed to be a comparable efficacy with the advantage that uh, valerian has fewer side effects and there's no evidence of tolerance developing. Valerian has also been studied in children and the elderly, the two populations that uh, may be prone to sleep um, disturbances and in whom um, you know, benzodiazepines may not be the safest drugs to so that's certainly encouraging. Um, there was one study in menopausal women with insomnia, which also suggested benefits. Uh, however, there was a, a meta-analysis that came out uh, a few years ago 
suggesting that they're really isn't a lot of objective evidence uh, of efficacy. And one of the problems with valerian research is that um, valerian has a very powerful and distinctive smell. And consequently, in a randomized control trial where you want to mask the drug uh, to see what can be tricky, patients can figure out what they're taking. <laughs> Recently, they've developed placebos um, that use some of valerian's inactive ingredients that actually give a similar smell. So that will make it easier to mask placebos in, uh, in future studies. Valerian has a lot of potentially active ingredients that are listed here, monoterpenes, sesquiterpenes, iridoids, alkaloids, um, GABA including, which uh, may be one of the contributors to the um, benzodiazepine-like effect. There's direct GABAergic activity and also decreased uh, GABA breakdown. And studies have shown that uh, it does indeed affect uh, the sleep um, architecture. As far as dosing, um, valerian is usually given in doses between 450 and 600 milligrams about two hours before bedtime. Um, higher doses don't seem to have much added benefit. Um, one important thing about valerian is that it doesn't usually work immediately as opposed to benzodiazepines. Um, usually what we think it does is promote natural health sleep over uh, a period of several weeks of use. So I usually tell people who are trying valerian, don't be discouraged if you don't see benefit right away. Give it at least uh, a couple of weeks and see if, uh, if your sleep gradually improves. As far as adverse effects, uh, valerian is very mild. Um, headaches and uh, gastrointestinal complaints are the most common, but not uh, often. There's no hangover effect from it compared to other um, hypnotic drugs, which is nice. There's been uh, some uh, reported cases of overdose without any significant uh, complications, uh, no drug-drug interaction. In fact, um, some studies have combined valerian with St. John's wort with good results. There have been some rare toxic reactions, uh, blurry vision, dystonias, liver toxicities, one case of withdrawal and delirium. But again, these are very rare and probably not uh, worrisome. There have been some, uh, some preparations of valerian that were thought to contain mutagens that could be potentially carcinogenic. But again, today, um, you know, manufacturing standards are higher, so that's probably less of, a, of an issue. Um, there was a, um, a study that um, retrospectively uh, asked women who had gone through pregnancy whether they had taken different herbal supplements. And um, it turned out the women who had taken valerian didn't have any adverse effects. But uh, I consider the data very limited. To really answer the question of safety in pregnancy, we need more prospective studies specifically to target that question. So we continue to, to advise caution in, uh, in pregnant women. So to summarize, the valerian appears to be promising for um, insomnia. And um, it may, in the long run, work as well as benzodiazepines, but again, uh, you have to give it time. It won't work uh, immediately uh, for most people. Uh, the fact that it uh, has no evidence of dependence is also uh, one of its uh, attractive characteristics. And finally, of course, uh, safety in children and the elderly uh, suggests that this could be a potentially good niche for, for valerian. And next, melatonin, another uh, sleep-inducing drug. This is a hormone that we all manufacture in the pineal gland of our brain, which you see on the, uh, on the left side of the, uh, of the screen. Uh, melatonin gained popularity among people who travel across time zones because it, um, it functions to reset the individual's circadian rhythm. Um, so it can accelerate um, you know, the recovery from, from jet lag. There have been about 20 studies on melatonin, including uh, some in children and the elderly. Um, there's actually a, a prolonged release form um, that uh, may give more even um, effect during the night. Um, but there are a few studies in psychiatric populations per se. Uh, mostly these are healthy individuals with mild insomnia or shift workers or people who are traveling across uh, time zones that have been the subjects of the, of the studies. Melatonin, as I said, um, resets the circadian rhythm um, because we, we manufacture melatonin primarily during the night. So by taking melatonin, it essentially tells your body that it's time to, to sleep. It's a very safe drug. There have been a few rare adverse effects documented, fertility problems, decreased sex drive, um, and other, other things. Um, again, these are very uncommon, and also uh, most of the individuals were taking melatonin with other drugs, so it's hard to specifically target melatonin as the cause. Melatonin does have in some immunosuppressive effects, so we do advise caution in patients with HIV. Uh, likewise, we don't know much about risks to uh, a fetus um, in a pregnant woman, so we do advise caution in pregnancy. 
As far as dosing, it's been shown that doses uh, as low as 0.25 to 0.3 milligrams a day are effective. You will find that a lot of commercial um, preparations of melatonin that you'll find in the health food store or in the pharmacy may have up to five milligrams of melatonin. Because there's some evidence that higher doses can cause daytime sleepiness or, or confusion, we recommend uh, starting patients on the lower doses and increasing gradually if, uh, if you need to. Um, some studies have examined melatonin in children with behavioral disorders, um, attention deficit disorder, other uh, developmental conditions. Um, by and large, the melatonin did not have effects on the, uh, on the developmental disorders per se, but it did help with sleep. So, so these children generally got a, a better night's sleep. So in this population, it may be a, a nice alternative to benzodiazepines. Finally, um, Inco Biloba is a, a nootropic or condition-enhancing drug. It also has a very long history in traditional Chinese medicine, um, primarily to slow down cognitive decline in dementia. Um, there's about 30 studies with Inco. Um, some of the uh, earlier studies have had methodological limitations, uh, in particular that they tended to rely on um, testing batteries, questionnaires, rather than looking at activities of daily living and real world function. Most studies today tend to, to look at the, the subject's uh, functioning in, in their regular environment. Ginkgo stabilizes neuronal membranes and scavenges free radicals, which uh, is important because it can protect um, brain cells that are still healthy in an individual with, with Alzheimer's. Um, Meta-analyses that have been done on Ginkgo uh, trials suggest that it is in fact uh, effective. Sometimes I get asked um, if, uh, if someone is young and in good health, uh, but you know has to multitask a lot, is under a lot of stress, needs to keep track of a lot of things, would, would it improve their memory to take um, Ginkgo? Um, there's actually been mixed results. One study suggests that there are benefits, another one suggests no, uh, no advantage to it. Um, in healthy middle-aged people who may have some mild um, cognitive decline, it seems to have beneficial effects. As far as prevention, um, again, going back to one of the key themes of this conference, well, right now, there's not a lot of evidence suggesting that starting to take ginkgo early would necessarily prevent a person from getting Alzheimer's disease. Uh, it's, an important, uh, it's an important question because certainly if you come from a family where there is a history of Alzheimer's, uh, you, you might want to ask yourself, would it be worth it to start taking ginkgo early? We need, we need more data. Now, um, for treatment of Alzheimer's, there are uh, a number of FDA-approved therapies, primarily the cholinesterase inhibitors, and Ginkgo has been compared against the cholinesterase inhibitors and actually combined with them. And by and large, um, efficacy is fairly similar, and when you combine Ginkgo with um, uh, cholinesterase inhibitors, there's actually um, a, a, an additive effect between the two, and actually improved tolerability, because certainly, um, Ginkgo generally has more tolerability than the cholinesterase inhibitors, and it seems to maybe uh, tone down some of the side effects from the cholinesterase inhibitors. Um, there have been a number of meta-analyses looking at studies as a whole, and by and large, um, ginkgo and cholinesterase inhibitors are better than placebo. The cholinesterase inhibitors may have a slight advantage in efficacy over ginkgo, but ginkgo has a clear advantage in, in tolerability. In fact, a, a lot of um, family practitioners and general internists will prescribe ginkgo as the first line for um, early signs of Alzheimer's simply because of its good tolerability. Um, and again, the, the possibility of combination being more effective than monotherapy is very encouraging. So again, a person can take the methods of Renevol and ginkgo as well. Uh, they don't have to be uh, mutually exclusive. Ginkgo is typically dosed between 120 and 240 milligrams a day. Um, at least eight weeks should be um, administered before you know, we start to draw conclusions. And um, it's not surprising that people who start uh, ginkgo at the early signs of Alzheimer's are the ones who have the best outcome. People with vascular dementias don't seem to respond as well to ginkgo compared to those with Alzheimer's. Um, but the full assessment of its effect may require at least a, a year. Uh, we don't have a lot of data on the long-term impact of the, uh, of the ginkgo on the, on the illness. Uh, for that, you need Another potential use for ginkgo might be to alleviate antidepressant-induced sexual dysfunction. Those of us who prescribe antidepressants uh, often get complaints from our patients uh, about not uh, having um, adequate sexual function in, in on different levels. Apparently, the addition of ginkgo to antidepressants may uh, reverse some of that sexual dysfunction. So that could be another niche for, for ginkgo. As far as
other side effects that are generally pretty mild. Uh, there have been some concerns in particular about seizures in people with epileptic disorders. Um, that's something you should be careful with uh, in, in patients with seizure disorders. Um, likewise, patients who are taking anticoagulants or who are having surgery should not take info because info inhibits platelet uh, activating factor and uh, that can result in increased uh, coagulability. Um, likewise, um, the, the PAF inhibition can increase risk of bleeding in pregnancy, uh, so we do advise caution in pregnant women. And finally, we don't know much about um, what uh, risk So to conclude, um, who are the people that I normally would um, steer towards herbal and other camp therapies? By and large, I think the best candidates have been people with mild illness who have a strong interest in CAM and don't mind the out-of-pocket costs. So as someone who treats a lot of depression, if I have a patient, say, who's acutely suicidal, this is not someone I would put on a, on a CAM therapy. I'd want to go with something that has more, more solid evidence.